This is the Capitol Rundown. Yes, yes, absolutely. I believe we're, we're, the, uh, President Biden can win, uh, and I believe that we'll be able to hold the Senate majority. The whole thing was they wanted the Roe v. Wade was federal, and they wanted it all back in the states where the people could vote. From my experience, I hope that uh, people um, give him the benefit of what he has done. It's all straight ahead. The Capitol Rundown starts now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Siobhan Klepfer. Whether in Lansing or Washington, D.C., a lot is happening in Michigan's political world. And we start with the presidential election, where Michigan is a battleground state. President Joe Biden is facing a test on the future of his reelection campaign. On Thursday, he tried to calm fears that he cannot beat former President Donald Trump in November in a solo press conference. Our Washington correspondent, Jesse Tenor, reports. The president spoke with reporters for about an hour, insisting he's not leaving the race, despite growing calls from Democrats to do so. And the best qualified to win. In his first solo press conference of the year, President Joe Biden shut down growing calls from fellow Democrats to end his reelection bid. I've got to finish this job because there's so much at stake. But the president fielded question after question about his ability to do that. We're organized, we're moving. President Biden used the majority of the press conference on the last day of the NATO summit to tout his foreign policy acumen and accomplishments at home. Just this morning, we had a great economic report showing inflation is down. But the president made a few slip ups. When referring to Vice President Kamala Harris, he mistakenly called her by another name. I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be vice president. And during the NATO summit, President Biden mixed up the names of two world leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. <laughs> president Putin. We're going to beat President Putin. President Zelensky. Some Democrats praised the president's performance, including North Carolina Congressman Wiley Nickel. I'm hoping that, that he put most of those questions to bed tonight and we can start talking about the issues. But a growing number of congressional Democrats, including New York Congressman Pat Ryan, are calling on President Biden to drop out of the race, arguing this election is all about beating former President Donald Trump. Joe Biden, as much as I respect and appreciate him, is not the strongest candidate to do that right now. The president, though, continues to deny polling that shows he does not have a path to victory against Trump. In Washington, I'm Jesse Tenor. Now, some Michigan politicians, both in Lansing and in Washington, have been speaking out on whether President Joe Biden should step aside for another Democratic candidate, and their opinions are mixed. One of those politicians is U.S. Senator Gary Peters. He talked to reporters on Wednesday about his bill providing fire departments with increased federal funding and took the time to show general support for President Biden. Uh, yesterday, I spent uh, time with him at the signing ceremony for the, the legislation that I, that I authored. Uh, he uh, was uh, as sharp as ever uh, and made, uh, I thought, some very good comments uh, prior to the, the signing. Uh, he engaged in some substantive conversations, not only with me and some other members uh, of Congress, uh, but also with many of the firefighters uh, who were there uh, as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. I believe uh, well, the, uh, President Biden can win. Uh, and I believe that we'll be able to hold the Senate majority, and uh, I think we also have a good shot of expanding it. However, the senator did not specifically say if the president should or should not run again. U.S. Congresswoman Hillary Shulton from Grand Rapids is calling on the president to leave the race, saying in a statement, quote, For the good of our democracy, I believe it is time for Biden to step aside from the presidential race and allow a new leader to step up, end quote. She's the first member of Michigan's congressional delegation to make that announcement. Well, coming up next here on the Capitol Rundown, Secretary of Energy and former Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm was in Michigan to talk to our Capitol correspondent, among other things, for an exclusive interview about the work in the Biden administration, about working with the Biden administration. We've got that and much more coming up next. Welcome back. Former Michigan Governor and current U.S. Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm was in Michigan on Thursday to announce a half billion dollar investment in a GM assembly plant in Lansing. The funding will be used to convert the plant to one that produces electric vehicles. But while she was here, our Capitol correspondent Tim Skubik took the time to ask her about working with the president, what she thinks of the future of the administration and who else might make a good president. So obviously we do have to talk about politics. You are inhibited in some way by the Hatch Act, which mm -hmm. limits what you can say. But let's start out with this. How does President Whitmer sound to you? Um, I think she would be an amazing president at some point. 
Do you think if there was a vacancy that she should be considered? Well, I, I don't want to make any assumptions. Uh, you're talking about right now, of course. Uh, I don't want to make any assumptions about what's going to be vacant or not. And I can't talk about it because of the election. But the bottom line is she is so talented and she's so capable and she's got such a great record. I think she's got a bright future. When's the last time you saw the president up close and personal? Um, I th want to say about a month ago, we had a bilateral meeting in the White House that I was uh, invited to with Poland. Um, we're, we have regular cabinet meetings. We just haven't had them for a couple of months, but I see him uh, regularly. And your take? My take is I am so frustrated by all this talk because he is on top of it. It's just really, uh, it's so frustrating in so many ways. But from my perspective, as somebody who has to present choices to him, he is, he asks, He's the hardest person to brief because you, he asks questions that you haven't even anticipated. Because of his years of service, he just knows so much. So when you go in to brief him, you better know your stuff because he knows it better than you do. So he is on it. It's so, uh, it's so for all of us cabinet members, it's so frustrating to hear all of this talk as though he, he doesn't have it together when in fact he does. So what happened the other night? You know, Tim, you moderated a number of my debates. I hate debates, and debates have, n the skill of a debate has nothing to do with governing. And sometimes you just freeze, sometimes you just don't have it. And uh, that happened to me on several occasions. I just think it didn't, it didn't happen for him. Well, coming up after the break on the Capitol Rundown, you will see the second part of Tim's talk with Secretary Granholm. That and much more still to come. Welcome back. Our Capitol correspondent Tim Skubik had the chance to talk to U.S. Secretary of Energy and former Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm about working in the Biden administration. Here's the second part of that conversation. So is he getting a bum rap on this yes, story? Is yes, the media yes, overplaying this? Yes, yes, yes. Well, that's an easy thing to say. The media overplays a lot of stuff, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'm glad we're holding up a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> that sometimes the truth hurts. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it is, uh, you know, from just because I have personal experience with him, it is overplayed from our perspective. I understand because people seeing the debate, why they would ask legitimate questions. But I'm just saying from my experience in seeing him on a regular basis, it is just that debate was an anomaly for what he does when he governs. I mean, we'll see what happens. Obviously, I can't again talk about the election, but I'm just saying that from my experience, I hope that uh, people um, give him the benefit of what he has done as president. I mean, honestly, we got a 3.9% unemployment rate in Michigan, more people employed than ever before. I mean, I only wish that I were governor at a time when I had a partner like you have right now in Washington, because it is really quite amazing. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's not just in Michigan, it's across the country. There's over 700 factories that have come back and said that they're opening up. This has never happened before, the amount of manufacturing that's going on, the fact that you have more people nationally working than it, ever before. The lowest unemployment rate for African Americans, the lowest unemployment rate for Hispanic Americans. I mean, it's just thing after thing. I mean, today we're talking on a day when, when the uh, inflation rate ticks down. Again, we got more work to do, but now it's at 3% or below. I mean, that's, it's just the progress is amazing. Where do you go from here after this? Let's, just, let's assume- Me personally? Yeah. What do you want to be when you grow up? I, am, I have the best job in the entire world. I thought being governor of Michigan was- It was best. great. It was at a tough time. This is so wonderful because, I mean, I actually wrote a book about this. Um, this I is read so it, wonderful because I have a boss who believes that we ought to have industrial policy to compete with those competitors globally. And he's putting his money where his mouth is. And it's a, a thoughtful strategy with an incredible team. And I just feel so lucky to be there at this time. Uh, from a strategy standpoint, would it be better off if the dialogue right now was not about that, but about coming together to get him elected? I, I think uh, it is important for people to, I, I think people don't fully realize how much progress is being made on the economy writ large. And so I do think it's important to have a dialogue about well, that. Well, you guys have done a lousy job, my word, not <laughs> yours, of selling this. I mean, you're- Well, you're, that's why I'm here, Tim. Well, yes, but you're three and a half years into the well, mission no, and everybody been. still sits there and he says, well, we, nobody knows what we're doing. Right, we're trying, we're trying. Well, I mean, there's, I mean, I'm just saying that the facts out there on the ground, the fact that he has created 
15.7 million jobs, more than any president in the history of the United States, by far more than his pre predecessor, even if you take out COVID. I mean, the, the GDP growth, by far more than previous president, uh, even if you take out COVID. I mean, there's just the factor after factor after factor is amazing. And I hope people take a full look at his record. And Tim also spoke with The Rundown's Jerma Duran about that conversation with Secretary Granholm and how the Michigan electorate is responding to the president's recent appearances. It's time to get updated politically here in the state of Michigan and nobody better than this guy right here, Tim Skubik, to help us out. Tim, we just watched your conversation with former governor and now energy secretary Jennifer Granholm. Obviously, she couldn't get into too much detail about the upcoming election because of the Hatch Act, but What's your takeaway from your time with her? Well, first of all, it was good to uh, have the governor back in town on an opportunity. She was very kind to agree to uh, grant us that interview. Uh, here's the takeaway. The, the, the people that are closest to the president who have hands on eyeball to eyeball, uh, almost to the person are saying, uh, th th this guy's on his game. Uh, I, Gov governor Gretchen Whitmer has been with the, the, the president. Uh, she did tell me some time ago that his walk is a little slower. You know, all right, no big deal there. So would say, uh, but uh, and, and she and the former governor agree that Mr. Biden is just fine, that uh, Mr. Granholm said that the debate performance was, quote, an anomaly and uh, no other proof of that. And then, of course, we had that news conference on Thursday night that ran for about an hour or thereabouts. Governor Granholm basically says, look, we've got a story to tell. Things are really going well. Uh, if we could only get over this hump of that debate performance and uh, she's out there trying to get the message out that Joe Biden is the guy. I thought after that debate performance or non-performance as uh, it might have been described, uh, that the polling numbers would take a major jump in favor of Donald Trump. In Michigan, it's still two points for Mr. Trump ahead of Mr. Biden, 47, 45, and that is in the margin of error, mm -hmm. which means it is a statistical dead heat. Yeah. So if there was collateral damage from that debate in this polling data in Michigan at least it has not shown up which has to be a win for the Biden people yeah. you know you always in politics you assume the, assume the worst uh, hope for the best and on this one uh, having a statistical tie in Michigan after that debate performance has got to be good news for the Biden people but they still have to build on that and get back the numbers that they may have lost in other places well, coming up next, you might have heard the term Project 2025 in recent political news. We'll tell you about the Republican plan to restructure the federal government and more when the Capitol Rundown returns. Welcome back. Project 2025 is getting the attention of Republicans and Democrats. The conservative plan is a sweeping overhaul of the federal government proposed by a group closely aligned to former President Trump. Washington correspondent Rashad Hudson has more. House Democrats say they are focused on defeating Project 2025. It's a collection of extreme MAGA ideas. The Conservative Heritage Foundation is behind the plan. It provides a detailed blueprint for overhauling the federal government. It would restructure employees, policies, and federal agencies, including eliminating the Department of Education. California Democratic Congressman Ted Lieu calls it concerning. I mean, this document is creepy. It's a takeover uh, of the American form of government. Over the past week, many Republicans have distanced themselves from Project 2025. Former President Donald Trump said he knows nothing about it. Potential Trump running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance says the former president has his own plan. What the media and the Democrats are trying to do is attach its most unpopular elements to the Trump administration. It's a 900 page document. I guarantee yep. there are things that Trump likes and dislikes. Florida Democratic Congressman Maxwell Frost says he heard from voters about the plan. They're scared to death of Project 2025 and the far right wing. Democrats hope Project 2025 will motivate voters to back President Biden. Reporting in Washington, Rashad Hudson. Coming up, we'll tell you about the changes made to the GOP party platform, the first in decades. That's next.
Last week, Monday, the Republican National Committee moved to adopt a party platform that reflects former President Donald Trump's position on abortion. For the first time in 40 years, the GOP will not officially call for a national abortion ban, instead allowing states to call the shots. And this came just a week before the party's nominating convention in Milwaukee, which is scheduled for tomorrow. Officials say the scaled down platform is only 16 pages and has limited specifics on many key Republican issues. The policy document document sticks to the party's long-standing principle that the Constitution extends rights to fetuses but removes language, maintaining support for a constitutional amendment banning abortion. In the past, Mr. Trump has touted his piecemeal stance on abortion. The whole thing was they wanted the Roe v. Wade was federal and they wanted it all back in the states where the people could vote and make their decisions. It's now up to the will of the people in each state. Some states will be more conservative, other states will be more liberal. It's happening now. You see the votes are all taking place. And it's the way every legal scholar and just about all the Democrats and all the Republicans and conservatives and liberals, they all wanted it that way. The anti-abortion group National Right to Life released a statement after the new platform was announced. In it, members said, quote, President Trump throughout his presidency championed policies designed to safeguard the lives of both unborn children and their mothers from unlimited abortions, end quote. If you're interested in getting more political news from Michigan and Washington, we've got just the thing for you. You can sign up for our Capital Rundown newsletter. It's just one email each week, and you can get it by pointing your cell phone camera at the screen right now. This will take you to the sign up page, or you can head to WLNS.com slash newsletter. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching the Capital Rundown. We'll see you all again right here next week.